Now, this has still nothing to do with the phenotyping of HEFPEF. Now, let's have a look at the different versions of phenotyping. There's a very nice paper you have here, the citation. I would encourage you to read it, but I want to summarize and focus in this lecture on the clinical phenotypes and the etiological phenotyping in patients with specific heart failure with preserve ejection fraction etiologies. So first of all, we talk about the clinical phenotypes because those are the patients you will very often encounter. Patients with coronary artery disease, systemic hypertension, also non-cardiac comorbidities such as diabetes, pulmonary hypertension, atrial fibrillation. Those are all diseases which are, which are common. So you will encounter those patients. And it's very important to think about the possibility that they can have elevation of filling pressures and therefore also a have a heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and then move on with, for example, the HFA PEF score. The etiological phenotypes, on the other hand, they have a specific etiology, which we are possibly able to treat in case of amyloidosis, we have medication at hand. In case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we do have very soon a potential medication at hand. And also in case of Morbus Fabri, we can provide treatment, medical treatment for those patients. So the etiological phenotyping is also very important as well. And when you perform echocardiographies, think about those etiological phenotypes and push your patients into the right direction for the right treatment. Now the clinical phenotype one I want to discuss for me is the arterial hypertension. So hypertensive heart disease. Very often in this case, for example, you see a peristernal long axis view and the valves are truly thick. They are approximately 14 to 15 millimeters. So truly thick walls, interventricular septum and the inferolateral wall over here. You also see that the valves are a little bit calcified, degenerative valves overall. But what is very striking is that this was a, a fairly young patient. It was, she was 55 years old at the time we took the echocardiogram and she had this huge LVH. Of course, you have to think about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and, and rule other diseases which can cause LVH out. But the only thing which was left overall was arterial hypertension. So she was admitted with a systolic blood pressure of 200 to 230 and she had it for several days and we lowered it very, very slowly because of course when she had a blood pressure of 160 170 uh, systolic measurement she already was feeling very dizzy and very bad because her body of course was used to the severe hypertension and of course it was untreated and very often you have a poorly controlled arterial hypertension so this clinical phenotype shows poorly controlled untreated long-standing hypertensive patients what happens? What is the sequel of this patient? Well, of course, the arteries, they are stiffening. Not only the heart becomes stiff, the ventricle becomes stiff, the atrium as well, but also the arteries. We have the remodeling, as mentioned, of the left ventricle. You can see it over here. That's now a apical four chamber view. You see it quite nicely. Also, left ventricular ejection fraction is borderline, so I would say it's around 50%, probably even mildly reduced. So we have to be very careful to call this heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. But still, we can see that it's definitely not severely reduced. This hypertension, this hypertensive heart disease causes a multi-organ inflammation, of course, an increased afterload. And this patient had a severely reduced exercise capacity. So furthermore, we can delineates that the left atrium is dilated. Also, the free wall of the right ventricle is thickened. And of course, again, the left ventricular hypertrophy. In this case, it's really concentric hypertrophy because the inner diameter of the left ventricle is fairly normal, but the heart, the walls of the heart, they are thickened. What about diastolic dysfunction? In this case, we have the four chamber view with a pulsed wave Doppler signal. We see the E wave and the A wave, and this is a so-called restrictive filling pattern. This is diastolic dysfunction, grade three and elevated filling pressures are definitely evident. So what we have to do is, of course, we have to control hypertension. If hypertension is controlled, the 
reduction hospitalization is evident. So if you control hypertension, the hypertension of this patient, they do not have to be admitted that often to the hospital. You have also a reduction in the onset of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and treatment improves overall clinical status. So for this specific patient, we, as I said, we lowered the blood pressure very carefully so that she doesn't stop the medication and she still stays compliant. But over time, we could control her blood pressure and she was, of course, feeling overall way better. We also added strain imaging and what you can see in strain imaging, which is also quite evident, is that there is a global reduction of strain. We see a global strain of minus 10.6. We have here the four-chamber view and the apical long axis view. And what we can also overall see is that there is an area which is blue. So this would be or denotes a dyskinetic area, which is not evident here. So it's a definite reduction in strain, but due to the severely thickened walls, this leads to, I would say, an overestimation of the reduction or the reduced function of the left ventricle, but still strain overall is definitely at least moderately reduced. Furthermore, I want to show you that there is still somewhat of a basal to apical gradient. So this is not a clear case of apical sparing, but of course, in hypertrophy, very often you have this gradient. Also in young health individuals, you have a certain gradient. So the, the basal segments, they, are, they don't have that high values. They are around minus 19. And in also young individuals, when you go to the apex, the values become more negative. So this partly apical sparing or this not severe apical sparing, we can see in amyloid heart disease. We also see in other forms of hypertrophy or hypertrophied ventricles. We continue with the measurement of the right ventricular free wall. We have to do this in the subcoastal image. This is a subcoastal four chamber view, the left ventricle, the right ventricle, and this is a focused view on just the parts of the free wall of the right ventricle in a subcoastal view where you should measure the right ventricular free wall. We do see that we should measure in this area and the measurement about four millimeters. And in this case, if I recall correctly, it was six to seven millimeters. It's definitely enlarged. So what else can we do? We can use left atrial strain and we see that we have a relatively normal curve overall. Here it is not 100% optimal, but we see that the strain is definitely reduced. Here the first value, minus 23, that's the pulse. That's definite reduced. Also the conduit strain with minus 13 and the contraction strain with minus 10, they're also reduced. I also want to mention that I put some links in the video description where you can see the normal values of left atrial strain imaging, because it's sometimes very hard to remember all these numbers. So just click the link and check those graphics out. Continuing with right ventricular strain, you see here also several values. You can see here the overall region of interest here the tracing, the strain M mode, and here the curves. And what we can visualize is that the global strain with minus 17.5 is reduced. Also, the free wall strain with minus 20% is reduced. The normal value would be in the range of minus 23 and more negative values. Whereas the TAPSI, the tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion with 19 millimeters is still normal. So we do see that the basal segment is contracting quite nicely, but the mid ventricular and overall the apical segment, they're reduced. So this leaves us with an overall reduction in free wall strain and in right ventricular strain imaging. Furthermore, we have to take a look at the IVC. The IVC is dilated. We have definitely a reduction, a little bit of collapsibility while inhaling is present. We also, when we scan the lungs, see some B lines. There's also pulmonary congestion present. And we do have a small plural diffusion. So this black space over here denotes free fluid in the plural space. We can evaluate the valves as well. We do see with color Doppler imaging that we have a probably here mild mitral regurgitation and a mild aortic regurgitation. Those are common findings in patients with hypertensive heart disease. Here we also do see the mild MR. So this small flare, this is the mitral valve, of course, this is the tricuspid valve, the aortic valve as well.